You're tuned to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcasted live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for almost 20 years years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, folks, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Happy Saturday, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and you know, what do inflation taxes, and divorce have in common. They all often affect today's retirees now more than ever. And, you know, we're starting to see higher inflation. This could continue due to largely increased government spending and actions of the Federal Reserve. Do you know that 20 percent, this is kind of alarming to me, 20 percent of all U.S. dollars that are in circulation were created in 2020, 20%. No one knows how inflation, how high that inflation could go or for how long. And inflation can really eat away at your retirement income. And you have to be careful. You know, inflation is, I I, I like to say it's kind of like cholesterol to your retirement income. It's a silent killer. You know, it doesn't have the the impact of a big market loss all at one time. But over time, it just slowly erodes your income, and you wake up in 10 years, and you're kind of like, well, where'd my income go? And then taxes can be a huge threat. You know, today's retirees have more wealth than any previous generation of retirees. And in my view, there's no question that taxes will be higher in the future. I don't know how far into the future. I don't know if that's near term or longer term. But I think we're liable to see a pretty dramatic change in our income tax structure. So this becomes a big risk to today's retirees. And then finally, divorce is becoming, unfortunately, far more common amongst Americans over age 50 than it used to be. And that has huge financial and estate planning consequences. So in today's show, we're going to discuss all of these things. What what to know about high inflation, the challenge with low interest rates, and how all that affects your money. You know, honestly, retirees are kind of getting squeezed with potentially higher inflation, but also low interest rates. A very powerful one-two punch that, that can squeeze you. You know, how divorce could affect your retirement and estate plans how you can contribute uh, to tax planning, how can you create an effective tax planning, uh, and also the, the threat of health care and how you can plan for that risk. We'll also answer some key retirement planning questions that you might have, and we'll talk about potential solutions to common problems. So let's kind of dive right in. We're going to start with the Federal Reserve on inflation. In the Federal Reserve's last meeting, It continued its commitment to easy money policy and acknowledged the accelerating economy. Now, when we say easy money policy, the the government is continuing to print money with their their bond buying program. So basically what they're doing is they're printing money and then they're in, in buying bonds, they're inserting that money into the economy. So there would be concerns maybe down the road about inflation. Now, interest rates, in the meantime, will remain at current near zero rates for the time being. The Fed said that, quote, inflation has risen, largely reflecting transitory factors, end quote, meaning things that are just kind of temporary. And they seemed unconcerned about the potential for higher inflation and the fact that March consumer prices rose 2.6%. So there are several challenges in what the Fed says there and how it affects you. 
in your financial plan to be retired independently and independent financially. You know, the, this low interest rate environment, and it's the lowest interest rate environment we've really had in our history, certainly since 1900. I mean, last year, the 10-year Treasury was under 1% for most of the year, starting in March. It's not there now. It's closer to one and a half. It's been fluctuating a little bit. But that's still historically very, very low. And, you know, one of the traditional investments for retirees to hedge interest rates, or, or excuse me, to hedge market volatility. So one of the traditional tools in the toolbox in investing is traditional bond exposure because bonds in the short term offer stability. The problem is traditional bonds move in an opposite direction of interest rates, the value of the bonds. You've probably heard that. So in other words, if interest rates go up, bonds go down. So think about it this way. Interest rates either stay very low, in which case bonds aren't paying much. I mean, they could go back down a little bit from where they are now, and I think they actually might. Uh, but they, they can't go much lower. So either interest rates stay low and bonds aren't paying much, or rates go up and traditional bonds do even worse. So that traditional approach of using U.S. bonds to hedge risk and provide potentially income could really be a challenge in the coming years. I would say decade, maybe even the coming decades. I mean, we could very well be on the front edge of an historic bear market in traditional bonds. Uh, the problem is they do offer stability in the short term, and they help hedge risk of the stock market. So what it becomes critical in an investment plan to have hedges that maybe other than just traditional bonds, you know, the whole idea behind diversification is you have things that when one thing zigs, another zags. So if one thing like stocks are way down or stock funds, hopefully they're not all way down. And there's other ways to do that, alternative holdings like commodities and energy. And even real estate, to me, real estate investment can be an alternative in investment asset class. And there are other ways to, to hedge with bonds where you're not stuck if rates go up. There are ways to do that. There are some, some bonds out there that have adjustable rates. It's kind of like the difference in an adjustable rate mortgage and a fixed rate mortgage. You know, if I have an adjustable rate mortgage and rates go from 3 to 5% on mortgages, well, then I have to start paying 5%. So the bank is making more money now. Whereas if I have a fixed rate mortgage, the bank is stuck. So there are and there's a lot of different ways to, to, to get that stability that we want with bonds to help reduce risk of, of market investments without being stuck if interest rates go up. Um, and, and be able to get a little bit of return if interest rates just stay very, very low. So how you diversify and how you manage risk and how you produce income is probably going to need to be, you know what, not probably, is going to be different than what it's been in the past 50 years. It just is. So, you know, you need a plan that's not, I mean, the traditional 60-40 stocks bonds, that's, that's just not going to work very well in the future. But the flip side is we've got an inflationary problem, potentially. And if we see higher inflation, retirees could really be hit the hardest by it. Inflation just eats away at your savings and at your income, especially when interest rates are being kept artificially low. So, you know, things are starting to cost more, but you can't earn more. You cannot earn more on your fixed rate investments. You know, believe it or not, since 2000, when you look at Social Security income, since 2000, Social Security benefits have lost – about a third of their buying power in the last 21 years because in uh, Social Security cost of living increases fail to keep up with the inflation experience by people over 65 years old. So think about that. If you in, 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 20, in two, the year 2000, if you were drawing $2,000 in Social Security income, whatever you're drawing now, You've lost a third. So let's say now you're drawing 
2,400. I, I haven't done the math as to what that would be. But let's say today you're drawing 2,400. That would be like drawing in in 2020 dollars. That'd be like drawing 1,600 instead of 2,400. You know, a third. You've lost a third of your purchasing power. So, in you know, that's a real challenge. And and in a that that's a perfect example of what I'm explaining. That you you're getting squeezed with low rates, yet the inflation you're we're all seeing is higher than we think. And the, now the Fed thinks that's going to be temporary. Uh, I actually think it will be somewhat temporary. I think it could get worse in the next 6 to 12 months because we have some real supply chain issues with supply and demand coming out of the pandemic. Uh, and I think we're going to continue to see some of that for a while until we reach a new equ- equilibrium with supply and demand. But the bottom line is inflation's been rising. March consumer prices went up 2.6%. That's the fastest year-over-year increase in consumer prices in three years. So you're, in your investment plan and your income plan, you have to have a plan to have stability of income in the, in the short term, but, but increasing income in the long term to beat inflation uh, or at least keep up with cost of living. So it becomes an even bigger challenge, and I think you have to do that with a a different approach to diversification with some of these other alternative asset investment classes where you hedge risk differently instead of the traditional mix of bonds, and then you need a different plan for income. Uh, You you know, you just got to have a different plan for income than, than what many people have done in the past. So those are real risks that need to be addressed. Now, these are the things that we do for our clients and that I talk about in my classes. Now, my classes for the spring are just wrapping up. My last class at the University of Tennessee just started this past week, so the final session is Tuesday night. Our next class is in August at Pellissippi State at their Hardin Valley class, at their Hardin Valley location. Uh, Then I'll be back at the University of Tennessee in September. And then in, uh, in November... We're doing a one-night class at Pellissippi State, Hardin Valley, right there in West Knoxville, just on tax planning. Tax planning in the new age. Now, we're still getting all that officially lined up. Uh, But if you want to see our upcoming class schedule, go to our website, broganfinancial.com. You can click on classes, and it'll show you the upcoming schedule. You can click to learn more and get a syllabus, and then also to register. When we come back... We're going to discuss retirement and divorce. Unfortunately, more and more people, we're seeing it more and more common, people over age 50 getting divorced later in life, and that can have tremendous impacts on your retirement and your estate planning. So don't go away. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. We come to you every Saturday, both at 9 a.m. and again at 3 p.m. You can also listen to all our podcasts online, broganfinancial.com. You can sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. You can also sign up for a complimentary review if you'd like, or if you'd like just to have a 15-minute conversation and ask a few questions. You can get all that information at broganfinancial.com. Now, you may have seen in the news, Bill and Melinda Gates are getting divorced after 27 years of marriage. And while anyone's divorce can be messy from both personal and a financial standpoint. Obviously, the Gateses have billions of dollars between them. You know, for those who get divorced later in life and who have accumulated more assets, the legal and financial aspects can be very complex. So if you're divorced or in the process of getting divorced, you, you, know, you need to know how it can affect your retirement and estate plan. So the division of assets can be more complicated the more you and your ex-spouse have. Now think about, you know, you may think about how complicated Bill and Melinda Gates' divorce will be, 
between both Microsoft and a multi-billion dollar charity under both of their names. And, of course, they've said they're going to continue to work together with their charity. But it starts if, – if for anybody, the later in life, the, the more you're apt to have accrued assets and the more that becomes potentially complicated and messy. Now, when it comes to Social Security, you are still entitled to a spousal benefit if you're divorced and never remarried as long as you were married for at least 10 years. So this is often overlooked is, again, if you were married for at least 10 years, you're eligible for all the spousal benefits that Social Security offers as long as you don't remarry. That would include spousal Social Security benefits where you get the greater of yours or one half of your ex-spouse's. And if you're divorced, your ex-spouse does not have to be drawing his or her benefit. You can still get half. Um, you also are entitled to widow or widower benefit, and a lot of people miss this. You know, a lot of people will think about the spousal benefit while you're alive, but then while your ex-spouse is alive, but you don't think about the widow or widower benefit because, see, when one spouse dies with Social Security, the other spouse, the surviving spouse, gets the greater of the two benefits. In other words, you get the greater of your benefit or your ex-spouse's benefit. And that's true of divorce spouses if you were married for more than 10 years and you didn't remarry. But most people don't know to even ask. And when it comes to divorce spouse benefits, you, you have to bring it to Social Security's attention and you have to prove it. You have to provide a marriage certificate, a divorce agreement. You have to show that you were married for more than 10 years. They're not going to connect the dots. You know, when you're married, Social Security is pretty good at connecting the dots. But when you're divorced, they don't connect those dots. Those dots. So Social Security benefits is one. Now, it's also important to understand the difference from a tax perspective of the different assets you own. And I see this fairly frequently where, you know, maybe there's retirement accounts. Usually there are, especially if you're in your 50s or 60s. So there's retirement accounts, and then there's other asset holdings, your house. Maybe you have other property. You have investment accounts. Now, here's the challenge with all that. Your retirement accounts, your IRA, your 401K, your 403B, you've never paid the income tax on most, if not all, that money. So you really don't own all of that money. Now, I've talked about that many, many times on this show, about the fact that you do not own all of your retirement account. The IRS owns part of it, and eventually the IRS has to get paid. Well, I can't help tell you. I mean, very often I'll see somebody come into my office that's divorced, and they took the retirement account, and the other spouse took other assets. Well, if you didn't account for the tax implication, that might be inequitable. Because, you know, $100,000 in a 401k is not worth $100,000 to you because the Uncle Sam has to get paid. So the tax implications of any asset that is owned in marriage has got to be considered in the division of assets in a divorce. Uh, the good thing is uh, when it comes to qualified retirement plans at work, uh, we, we, you can have an order that's signed by the court in the divorce proceeding where a retirement account can get split and there's no negative tax implication. Like there's no, it's not a taxable distribution. Like how do you get half of your spouse's retirement account without having to pay tax as a taxable distribution? Well, you can, an attorney would draft this. It's called a qualified domestic relations order. QDRO, people call that a quadro. And that means you can have the 401k, for example, whatever the amount is that's agreed to in the divorce can be put into your name as if it's your 401k. Uh, and then there could be negative implications, actually, if you roll that into an IRA before you're 59 and a half. So there's, it gets kind of complicated. 
uh, your you know people've got to understand those rules because it affects access, it affects income taxes, and all these things. You know, if you have a highly appreciated piece of land, there's a capital gains exposure to whoever gets that asset. So the taxes kind of get interwoven with the asset values that have to be considered to be sure that you, that all of the division of assets is equitable for both parties. Now then, health insurance, you know, one spouse may be covered under the other's employer health care plan. They'll need to make alternative plans at some point. And, you know, if you're not going to go back to work, so that can be complicated. So, you know, and then how you handle beneficiaries is so important. People, you know, when they set up beneficiaries, when, when you're – think about it. When you're setting up a retirement account, an IRA, a 401K, a life insurance policy, which is not a retirement account, but, you know, when you do those things, you, you're asked – there's a box on there where you're asked to name a beneficiary. And typically you name your spouse and then your children if, you're, if you have kids as a contingent beneficiary. Well, that beneficiary designation has full control and authority over who gets what. It does not matter what's in your will. So, so, you know, this was challenged in court, and it, and it actually went all the way to the Supreme Court years ago, where a husband and wife had got divorced, and all of the legal documents were changed. The gentleman got the retirement accounts, the husband, and he uh, redid his will, everything about that. He never redid his beneficiary designation for his 401k. And they had one daughter together, so he had put everything in the will to go through his daughter. Well, the beneficiary designation supersedes the will. So when he, he ended up dying, and under law, the beneficiary designation governs, so the money went to his ex-wife. So the daughter sued her mother. Clearly, the ex-husband wanted it to go to his daughter, but he didn't change his beneficiary designation. It went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the ex-spouse because beneficiary law is very, very clear. You know, beneficiary law can also be an issue when you get remarried because if it's a 401k plan, as an example, 401ks are governed by ERISA the Employment Retirement Income Security Act that was passed in the 1970s. And under ERISA guidelines, the spouse has an automatic right to the 401k or any other plan that's covered under ERISA. So a prenuptial agreement does not cover an ERISA retirement account like a 401k because the spouse has to sign a waiver after the marriage under ERISA law. So the prenuptial doesn't cover it. The legal documents don't cover it. And if you don't fix all that within a year, after a year of marriage, everything's in stone unless you have your, sp- your new spouse sign a waiver after you are married. So with more and more people getting divorced later in life, this does become more and more complicated. And... You know, your professionals have got to know how to deal with these kinds of things. Now, I will say in our retirement class, I don't really get heavy into divorce issues. I do cover at length divorce spousal benefits and widow benefits with Social Security. But a lot of these other legal implications are very, very important as well. Uh, So, you know, if you're somebody who is getting a divorce or have had a divorce and you'd like to talk, we could even start out with a 15-minute conversation on the phone. Um, you know, email us. You can go to our website and email us through there. You can also email us info at brokenfinancial.com. That's I-N-F-O. Or feel free to give us a call uh, right here in Knoxville, 865, of course. And then it's 862-6800. Now, when we come back, are you taking on too much investment risk especially in those early years of retirement, and how do you need to create a tax plan to reduce that investment risk? So don't go away. 
You're listening to More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI, where it is all about living the best years of your life your way. And today, in this segment, we're going to talk about taking the proper kind of investment risk in retirement and when you're getting ready to retire. You know, the state of the market, the stock market, at the time of your retirement is not within your control. Even if you save diligently your whole working life, a market downturn around a significant market downturn around the time of your retirement can impact your wealth for the remainder of your lifetime. And I'm getting asked this kind of question a lot because the market is continuing to surge to all-time highs. And I'm getting more and more, the two most dominant thoughts that I'm getting from you when I'm in the community, when I'm teaching classes, when I'm visiting with you in my office, The most two common thoughts is, Jim, the market's got to have a correction sometime. And then the second thought is, Jim, taxes, income taxes have got to go up. They're going to go up. Let me rephrase that. I'm not necessarily hearing you say income taxes have to go up. I'm hearing more. They're going to go up. You expect them to go up. So let's talk first about the investment realities. Here's the thing about markets. We just don't know when the markets are going to go up and down. Uh, Fundamentally, I believe two things about the markets. One is that they're very, very unpredictable. And number two is that they're very, very volatile. And I just think it gets very, very dangerous trying to time the markets. And one of the real keys is to be invested for the bull market surges. But if you don't want to try to time that because you fundamentally believe you don't know when those things are going to begin and the bear market is going to be end or that bear market's going to begin and the bull market's going to end, then you have to be invested. And that means that you get to experience the surges in the bull markets, but you also experience the declines in the bear markets. So that has to be carefully balanced and monitored. And, you know, investing is all about balancing risk and reward. We all want to make money. We don't want to lose a lot of money. And usually, the older we get, the more close you get to retirement or as you are retired, most of the people that I talk to do not want to take the same kind of risks that they took when they were in their 30s and even 40s and maybe early 50s, but especially in their 30s. That's just a common thing that I hear. People come into my office. You don't have the same appetite for losing a lot of money as you did in your 30s. Now, there's exceptions to that. I sometimes have people come in, and they have quite an appetite for risk because they believe in stocks for the long run. But most I talk to want to manage that downside risk. But then you also need growth. You've got to have growth in the long term to beat inflation. We talked about that earlier in the show, in the first segment. So it becomes tricky. And as I said, we don't know what the markets, what the state of the market's going to be when you retire. And here's the challenge. Whatever happens, whatever happens in the first 10 years of your retirement to your money has a disproportional effect to your retirement success or failure. So let me put it this way. Over 80%, let's let's say you retire at 65 and you live for 30 years. 80% of your outcome over those 30 years is determined in the first 10 years. In other words, the last 20 years really doesn't drive a bit, doesn't really make a big as big a difference. The first 10 years are critical. And the first five years determined over 50% of your outcome just in the first five years. In other words, If you have a significant hit to your investments 
and your savings in those first five years of retirement, it could be very, just absolutely devastating if you don't have a plan to deal with that. And we don't control when the, you know, whether we have that big hit in the first five to ten years. Likewise, if you're reti- let's say you're planning on retiring in a year or in two years, and we see a bear market right before you retire, you may be impacted where now you can't retire anymore. Well, that's no good either because you, you don't want markets dictating when you can retire. You want to retire on your terms. So there are a few keys to this, like how do you put together a plan where you're not really much affected if the markets are down substantially in the early years of retirement. You can do that, more than likely. I mean, we we never know what markets could do in the future, but more than likely, I mean, we've been very successful at creating those kinds of plans for our clients for 20 years. So there's two key components to that. One is you don't need to depend on market investments for income. You know, in other words, you don't want to be living on investments that are going up and down in value every month and week and day because inevitably they're going to be sharply down. I mean, we are going to have a bear market at some point. And when they're sharply down, that means you're having to sell them off when they're down and spend the money as income. And then you've compounded your loss. That money will never, ever come back because you've spent it. You know, it's okay to sell something when it's down and reinvest it, but you never want to sell it and spend it because you'll compound those losses. So you need to have other options to go to for invest for income in retirement when markets are down, which inevitably they will be. So you, your investments, your risk investments need to be structured with an eye to long term. Now, long term is not going to be 20 or 30 years, but you need to have a minimum. It would be five years that you don't have to depend on your market investments for income, but I'd prefer seven or even, you know, say six to eight years. You don't have to worry about your risk investments. And then think about that. If that's you and you're getting ready to retire or you just retired, you're not going to worry about is the next bear market this year or next year or in four years because your your risk investments are invested a little bit longer term. Now, the flip side is, you you know, if you're invested for a six- or seven-year horizon, you still can't take full-on stock market risk. I know very few retirees that can just be full-on stock market risk because they need income at some point in the shorter term, meaning the next, say, 10 years. Now, you, you may say, well, Jim, I don't need my income, but what about your minimum distributions from your retirement accounts? How are you going to fund those minimum distributions? Now, yes, if you turn around and reinvest those, you can take more risk, but you are going to have to pay income tax on what's taken out. So you're, you're, th- there is going to be a hit, an expense in, incurred by taking that investment out once you turn 72 and have these minimum distributions. So having a plan to balance risk you know, you should be more diversified, and this goes back to what I talked about in the last segment or a couple segments ago, you need a mix of a lot of different things to to, to help hedge risk so you don't have such a volatile portfolio. One of the real keys to successful investing, even in the long term, is that you don't lose quite as much as the stock market loses in bad markets. Now, somebody who's young and is investing for 30, 40-year time horizon, you know, you can take full stock market risk. I would still say, hey, let's shave off just a little bit of that risk because you can probably, you know, in many cases get a superior return like that when you average in the bull markets and the bear markets. But closer to retirement, you need more diversification and balance to hedge investment risk. And, you know, that traditional bond exposure is not going to be a productive or in the future, in my opinion. So you need other kinds of diversification in alternative asset classes like commodities and real estate and energy and non-traditional bonds, bonds that can go up in value when interest rates go up rather than down in value when interest rates go up. So having a different approach to diversification and a different approach to income where you're not selling off shares of an investment to generate retirement income is critical to reducing investment risk, 
in the early years of retirement. I cannot stress that enough. Now, when we come back, I want to hit a little bit about tax planning. I specifically want to talk about the different rules for how you can get money into a Roth IRA. And then I also want to talk a little bit about the threat of long-term health care and, and needing a plan for that, whether it's to self-fund or, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the traditional insurance options out there now, but we'll get into all of those things. So don't go away as you listen to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Thanks for tuning in to More Living here on Saturday. The first Saturday. No, it's not the first Saturday of May. That was last week. Today is the 8th. And uh, hopefully it's going to warm up here pretty soon. We're on every week at 9 a.m. and again at 3 p.m. So uh, if you miss part of this show and you want to hear the whole thing, you can catch us again in the 3 o'clock hour. You can also listen to our podcasts online at BroganFinancial.com. We'll have this show up uh, probably sometime Monday, Uh, certainly by Tuesday, but usually it's up by Monday. So do check us out. Uh, Let's talk about – when we talk about tax planning, I just want to talk a little bit more about Roth IRA. You know, we've seen increased government spending due to COVID, and we're likely going to see more in the future. And this could mean a larger tax bill later on. You know, we're in a low tax environment today in terms of federal income taxes. Our highest income tax bracket is 37%. In the past, it's been as high as 94% in 1946. For most of the 1950s, it was over 90% on income over $200,000. In the 70s, it was 50. It was uh, 70 percent in most of the 70s. In the 80s, for six years, it was 50 percent, and then it went down in 1986. It went down under 20, under 30 percent. And we've been in this low income tax era where our highest income tax has been under 40 percent for 35 years. And I think because of this spending and the pandemic and all the stuff that's been necessary to keep us out of the out of a, a, a depression we have to unwind this and, and figure out how we're going to pay for all this so there are many long-term tax minimization strategies Roth IRA is one of them now to be clear Roth IRA works if your tax bracket when you put the money into the Roth IRA is is lower than when you pull the money out of the Roth. So think about that. If you're in your 50s or 60s and you're not retired yet, your taxable income is probably a a good bit higher than it'll be once you're retired. Now then again, at age 72, you have the minimum distributions from IRAs. You're going to have to start taking out about 4%. So that is going to change your tax environment in retirement. But what are you making now? So, yeah, tax rates may go way up, but your taxable income may way go, da- go way down. So where the Roth works is if you're confident your taxes, or if you're not sure, you want to hedge it. And, you know, if you've got large retirement account balances at age 72, your tax rates, you'll lose a lot of control of your income taxes at 72. A lot of times, those early years of retirement, when you're between retirement age and age 72, can really be a sweet spot for effective planning. So let's talk about some of the limitations. There are limitations. Single filers with a modified adjusted gross income of over $140,000 cannot contribute to a Roth IRA out of their current income. Married couples over $208,000 do not qualify. But there are alternative things you can do. So first off, if your company offers a Roth 401k, there are no income limitations on that. You can go up to $19,500 if you're under 50. If you're over 50, you can do $26,000. Also, on a Roth conversion, there are no income limitations. You can convert traditional IRA to Roth IRA. You pay the income tax up front. Then after five years, it's tax-free. After 59 and a half, and there's no income, there's no income limitation. 
Now, a working spouse, you may be able to contribute to a Roth IRA on behalf of your non-working spouse. If you file taxes jointly, it's called a spousal Roth IRA, and there you can go all the way up to $208,000 of joint income before that goes away. So understanding the Roth rules can be a real attraction. So the tax plan, the other thing I'll mention on the tax plan, and and by the way, I'd mentioned long-term care costs. I want to finish up. We're almost out of time, and I really want to figure, finish up this tax stuff. So we'll cover the long-term care you know, risks. We'll cover that on a, in a segment in the future. I think the other big tax opportunity is looking at long-term capital gains and positioning your affairs now, your investments, where you can take advantage of long-term capital gains as long as those things do stay on the books as a tax incentive. See, since for, for a long time, our Internal Revenue Code is structured in a way to encourage investment. And what that means is investments that are not in IRAs and 401ks and other retirement accounts, you can get any capital asset. If you buy something and you sell it for a gain, that would be a capital gain. I mean, I could literally buy anything, and technically if I sell it for a profit, that is a capital gain. That's report. That's taxable. And if you hold it for more than a year and then you sell it, it's a long-term gain. Well, across the board... Long-term capital gains for almost all taxpayers offer better tax rates than ordinary income. You know, many taxpayers, we actually have a 0% long-term capital gains rate in the Internal Revenue Code. Then it goes to 15, then it goes to 18.8, and then to 23.8. And along the line, when you're, no matter what your income is along the line, Typically, your tax rate on a long-term capital gain is much lower than on ordinary income. Now, you don't get long-term gain treatment on, in, on distributions coming out of IRAs and 401ks and other retirement accounts you, because those things are taxed as ordinary income. So it's important that in your investment and tax plan that these things are all coordinated together so that you can take advantage of long-term gains in the future. You know, a, long, a lot of times I have people come into my office and they've got, you know, the, most of their capital investments, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, exchange-traded funds, are inside their retirement accounts where they don't get long-term capital gains treatment. And then outside the, uh, the retirement accounts, they've got more, you know, bank holdings and things like that that, don't, that, that, that pay interest. They're, they're, not, they're really not invested for long-term gains. So these things need to be coordinated and structured. The, the location of your investments become critically important. Can you take advantage of capital gains? And how do you structure your plan to effectively take advantage of maybe even a 0% rate in the early years of retirement? Okay, we're unfortunately out of time. Today we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about inflation. We've talked about the low interest rate environment and the squeeze that inflation combined with the low interest rate environment can put on today's retirees. We've talked about the challenges of divorce later in life. We've talked about investment risks in the early years of retirement. We've talked about tax planning. So we've talked about comprehensive planning, really, because gre greater Success with money can create a greater life so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you, Chris, for engineering. Thank you to Jill producing the show. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Have a very blessed weekend. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.